Well, to start with, the top five was a strategy that I had been using for about a decade uh, that uh, as a tool so that there was a foundation upon which to have a discussion uh, with the organization. And at first it was um, a destroyer squadron, so I was an 06. Uh, by the time I got to be the CNO, I frankly wasn't sure that the top five would work at that level with an organization that's got several hundred thousand people involved. But uh, we worked through it in the transition team. The transition team was so incredibly helpful to me. So the number one priority was people. Some people call it manpower. That's kind of a programming term. To me, it was people. Number two was current readiness. Number three was future readiness. All the investments in the future, new ships, new airplanes, new submarines, new combat systems, that kind of thing. Number four was uh, quality of service. And this, we could not talk about this without also linking it with priority number one, winning the battle for people. Alignment could be all about the organizational chart and who works for who. And there was some of that that uh, we had to uh, work on. That wasn't the real thing. The most important thing was communications alignment. And it gave me an opportunity to talk about these things that we needed to all be in sync about serving the nation, uh, giving options to the president around the world, around the clock, anywhere any time, options for the president um, to take credible combat power to the four corners of the world. And because we could use the high seas, we could do it without a permission slip. So those were the top five. Um, winning the battle for people, current readiness, future readiness, power, uh, quality of service, and alignment. The biggest issues I thought facing us was first this people thing. Um, we had, in my career, I've been in the Navy 32 years, we had made our reenlistment goals once. Once. Uh, we, we had to do something about that. The most satisfying thing to me that first year was that we broke all the records for retention in year one. We set a stretch goal, not of 38%, of 57%. We didn't make it. We only made 56.7%. And we did it having this conversation about service, the quality of service thing, um, and serving. And our discussion uh, was straightforward and direct. Hey, we do hard things, but in the Navy, we do them as a team. And we're here to serve the nation and try to make a difference for the nation. Um, and so by the time 9-11 happened, we were already winning that in a big way. Uh, second, and at least as important, both of these are critically important. When we put the transition team together, we said we were going to invest big time in current readiness. And I had been a sink commander-in-chief of the Atlantic Fleet uh, before I got to be the CNO. What would happen is readiness would be up like this, and then after the deployment, it would go way down like this, and then when it's time to deploy again, they pull, pour all the money in it, and the readiness would go up like this. Well, you know what that proved to us? Sailors don't want to be in the Navy like that. And I said we were going to throw all the resources we had at the current readiness problem because I didn't believe that we could do the things that we are called upon to do. We had a contract with the citizens of the United States of America who invested hundreds of billions in our Navy, and that bathtub made it so that a lot of our stuff wasn't ready to go in crisis. Uh, and I had before, on my duty on the Joint Staff, I was the director for operations as a three-star, and I had a good sight picture of how challenging the world was 
And I believe that uh, our readiness posture was totally unsatisfactory. And that's what I told the Secretary of Defense when he interviewed me. Well, so what happened here? We, the president, new president came into office and gave us a billion eight and we had programmed part of the transition. We were going to reprogram uh, about close to $10 billion. The number was actually nine something. And, and actually in that, in that day and age, that was almost 10% of our budget. We poured money into readiness like it was going out of style. Um, and so when 9-11 happened, our force was more ready than it had been in ages. Um, I remember then uh, after that, as tensions were mounting, we were going to go conduct operations in the Middle East. I remember one day I was in the tank, never forget this. And our, our standard requirement was to have one carrier group deployed in the Pacific and one in the Atlantic, right? We were also supposed to have another one ready to go within 96 hours on each coast. The truth was we didn't have the resources to do it. We didn't have the ordinance. We did not have the spare parts and I could go on and on. But the point is the readiness posture that had existed with this bathtub of readiness, we couldn't muster, we couldn't muster that second, uh, uh, that third and fourth carrier. We, and so what we started doing is that we would pause in the middle of the ocean in the Atlantic and swap ordinance and all kinds of things. Uh, after 9-11, and it was in November, December, before we started conflict uh, in Iraq, I'll never forget it. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff turned to me and he said, Vern, can I have four carriers? And I said, uh, yes, you can. You can have eight if you want it. We had eight battle groups totally in the green ready to go. And we built a current readiness posture that was unlike anything we had had and I, did, I had experienced in my entire career. Well, I believe that the coal was a shocking wake up call for everybody. Uh, for us, it, you know, I'd only been seeing over a couple of months. For us, it was this gave us an immediate clear understanding of the nature of the new threat, the asymmetric threat. But also we had to ask ourselves hard questions about had we done enough for the men and women that were serving on the USS Cole. And I believe in addition to everybody having this uh, 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 sudden awareness of the new threat that we were facing, not a threat where, you know, some task force is steaming over the horizon, but where they're looking to exploit any uh, situation that they can to their advantage. Uh, it, it changed the way we uh, did everything. Huge focus, renewed focus on force protection from every single day, every kind of an event, event that is occurring wherever you are in the world, including at home. And so now there are major, major increases uh, in uh, the protection forces that have to be around, even sitting in home port. Uh, everybody became uh, immediately much more attuned to a bigger and wider spread threat than we really uh, had focused on before. In addition to that, it prepared us for the, to, it prepared us thinking about confronting enemies. Uh, this isn't something that in the older days, I would tell you, we thought about it when we were getting ready to deploy. We're, you know, we're going, uh, always we were going to places around the world where the tension level was a lot higher than it was at home because the United States of America was an island nation and we really uh, accounted that as part, as our, part of our own defense. Everybody uh, had to have uh, you know, had to really give serious consideration to the way we were thinking about the, the challenge and the problem. In addition to that, it called on every sailor, uh, every sailor to uh, think about their own personal commitment 
to the United States Navy and to the United States of America. So I'll never forget October the 12th, um, right after I took over as CNO in the year 2000. At five minutes till six in the morning, my hotline rang. It's the commander of the fifth fleet. And he tells me that the coal's been attacked. And I said, well, what do we know about it? And he said, that's why I'm calling you. I have no communications with the ship. I do not know the circumstances down there yet. They're in Aden, Yemen. Um, and uh, I'm working to get that information, but all the information I'm getting is coming from the embassy there in Yemen. Wow, this was a shock. So we didn't know how bad it was, but we knew they couldn't communicate. Over the course of the next few days, you know, we began to understand exactly what had happened. Um, I, how did sailors react to that? I believe that all of us reacted with a sense of determination. They killed 17 of our sailors. And I'll never forget it. At the end of the week, I believe that the 12th was on a Tuesday. It was Thursday or Friday. We were having a memorial for them. The, and a number of the sailors had been flown back to the United States. And a number of injured sailors were also flown back. And that morning, the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy and myself uh, were part of the memorial service on the pier in Norfolk, Virginia. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Because before we went to that ceremony, we met each of the families. And I'll tell you, that was a sobering day for one guy named Vern Clark. And there we were. The president went in first and wanted to be with the families privately. And pretty soon, the national security advisor, Sandy Berger, came and said, Vern, you got to come in here right away. There's a mother in here who's having a real hard time. And I went in, and there was the family collected together. Her, two of her sons, a couple of cousins, and maybe it was grandma was there. And she looked at me, and she said, where's my son? because we hadn't brought him home yet. And uh, she and I, you know, I just wrapped my arms around her and began to tell her how thankful that we were, that she had decided to share her son with the United States Navy and with the United States of America. How sorry we were for the loss of life, but he was greatly respected and his service was so important and his example was so important. And I want to tell you, I had this incredible uh, sense of loss for those families. And I think all sailors really felt that that day and that week and that month and that year. And then of course, 9-11 occurs and we have uh, more things to focus on. But the Navy went through that crisis before 9-11. And I wanna tell you, on that particular day, I turned to the director of the Navy staff, Vice Admiral Patricia Tracy, and I said, Pat, find our people. Um, when, when the USS Cole occurred, finding our people was an issue. We didn't have communications. Who was it? Who had we lost? And all of those pieces. I want to tell you, when 9-11 occurred, uh, she called me at 1 o'clock in the morning and said, Admiral, we've found them all. We lost 42. Uh, we had learned that from the experience with USS Cole. We had an obligation to families to get the information to them as soon as possible. And it further then sharpened the focus that we had on all aspects of the top five, that we had to be successful in all of these areas for us to have the kind of Navy that was needed uh, in the challenging days that we were living in. So we had no headquarters. We lost our command center, but we lost 80 plus percent of our spaces. Um, I'll never forget that morning. I didn't have a place to have a meeting with them. And the staff had arranged and the Marine Corps had agreed to let us use their spaces up at uh, Navy Annex, where the Marines also had uh, part of their component headquarters was located up there. They were also in the Pentagon, but they were in both places. And so they offered their large conference room to us. 
And I remember walking in that morning and I had to ask, invited direct reports and some key people, including SES civilians uh, and, and flag officers. So it was all that admiral level people. And when I went in that morning, uh, the first thing I did was to just listen. I said, okay, um, let's go around the room. Tell me where you stand. Let's focus on what we need, what you have been working on since yesterday morning. Fundamentally, it was 24 hours after the, uh, after they hit the, hit the building. And so we went around one at a time and I listened to each of them tell me what they had done, where, what their posture was and so forth. And then uh, I began my comments and I said, uh, okay, first of all, what's the most important thing we have to do? We have to come to grips with the fact that we are at war. War has not been declared. I wanna make sure every single person in this room understands we are at war. Number two, we do not have a Navy headquarters in Washington, D.C., where it's supposed to be. It's gone. Your calling today is this. Each of you, there's no new building space waiting for us. We won't be able to put our whole staff together. Tomorrow is going to be different, and for months it's going to be different than it's ever been. We won't be able to walk down the hallway to one of our cohorts and talk over a challenge or a problem or a solution. That's not going to happen that way. But by tomorrow, you need to have a headquarters. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm giving you full authority to act. And don't ask for, for permission. Just go build a headquarters because we have 400,000 sailors out there. They deserve a headquarters. This isn't for us. <laughs> this is for them. And then we're going to be able to provide the support that they need and that our nation needs so that we can keep our Navy moving forward. And so, and you know, we started. And then I said, uh, now look, we have identified the 42 people that have lost their lives. And we are going to take better care of those families than anybody ever dreamed of. But I wanna make sure we understand the vision of responsibilities. The people in this room aren't going to do that job because you have another job to do. And that is to lead the United States Navy in your areas of responsibility. So my charge to you today is find the best men and women in our organizations globally find the very best people we have that we believe will be the most expert at helping every family through this season as we go through 42 families that have lost uh, their loved ones that's their your responsibility to get the right people to do that that's not your responsibility to personally do that i have other things in mind for you and what I have in mind for you is to provide the kind of leadership that is required when we are an, in an all out war in a, against terrorists who are trying to destroy our way of life and destroy our, this institution called the United States Navy. Now, I do want to tell you something else that happened on the 12th. At 6 p.m., the president came to the Pentagon. I don't know if you remember, but he was out of town that day. In fact, in Florida, when the uh, towers were hit. Late in the day on the 12th, the president comes to the Pentagon. Uh, he walks in. It's a small room, no hanger-ons. Uh, I believe that I'm trying to remember it. My, it there were eight people seated at the table or 10. That's how small it was. And it was a very small conference room. He walked in and sat down at the head of the table. Secretary Rumsfeld was sitting to his immediate right. He turned to the secretary. There was no happy to glads, no how are you, you know, any of that stuff. That's not what was going on that uh, afternoon. He turned to Rumsfeld and said, uh, do you have an update for me? And Rumsfeld gave him an update and I could tell by the way, the nature of the update that they had been talking regularly and had talked within the last couple of hours because of the timing and the things that the secretary mentioned. But it was very brief. And then the secretary then the president turned to the secretary and he said, 
finger out like this. Don't you ever forget yesterday. And then to the next person, don't you ever forget yesterday morning. And one at a time to each of us at the table. Don't you let the tyranny, the urgent, and the busyness of the day cause you to forget what happened yesterday and went all the way around the room. And when he finished, she said, I promise you, I will not forget. There's one other thing I want to share with you about uh, the communications with the president. I don't know if you remember, but the attack occurs on the 11th and on September the 20th, there was called a, a session of joint session of Congress where both the Senate and the House come together and the president was addressing the nation and addressing the Congress. And this was an incredible evening for us. And again, you know, the sense of tension globally was uh, uh, just incredible. It was palpable. You could feel it everywhere. And everybody still has a remembrance of where they were on 9-11. On the 20th, the president gave what I believe was the greatest speech he ever, ever gave in his life. And it was such a wonderful environment because there was such a sense of unity. I mean, you remember right after the attacks on the evening of the 11th or the 12th, uh, um, I, I, I'm not sure now if it was the first day or the second day, uh, members of Congress are, sta are standing on the steps of the Capitol singing, God bless America. I mean, you know, it was such a moving time. On the 20th, he's giving this speech. Before the speech, the Joint Chiefs are always over there for the State of the Union address, and we're always sitting on the front row or the front two rows, all the way over on the left. That night, and the Supreme Court sits in the center and the cabinet is right behind them. That night, there was only one member of the Supreme Court there. We weren't all the way over on the left. We were right in the middle next to the Supreme Court. Um, halfway through the speech, the president, there was a pause in his presentation. And then he said, I have a message for our military. And there we are each of us, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, sitting on the front row. I have a message for our military. Your time will come and you will make us proud. Be ready. I told that story to sailors all over the world. The president gave us direction be ready and we're more ready than we've been in years and years and we are going to answer the call then i want to tell you this story about um, they asked me to come to the arizona to do the commemoration for the 60th anniversary of the attack on pearl harbor now, I'd been out there a number of times, but I hadn't been on the Arizona Memorial. And it was an incredibly moving day. And I remember this day like it was yesterday because of the things that happened out there that day. Uh, first, there was this occasion, there was a, there's a Navy pier there that Navy only boats can come and go uh, for whatever need, but in this case, going to the Arizona. Uh, that morning and they were going to take us out there. And then there was the commercial uh, uh, platform. It's not a big pier, it's a platform where you could board the boat. And there was a big crowd of people over there. And uh, you know, I kind of, I was, we were waiting for the boat and I kind of wondered what it was. And I just, it was only a few, you know, I don't know, maybe 50 or 75 feet apart. And I decided to walk over there and introduce myself and I'm in full dress white. and. Uh, uh, and, but I walked over there and, and I've met this family and, and they, this group, there was close to 20 of them and they were there because grandpa was a survivor of Pearl Harbor. And it was really clear that what they wanted to do, grandpa wanted to come back 
one more time. He was getting up in years, and his, uh, one of the family members told me, he said he wanted to come back one more time, and we all know that he doesn't have too many years left. And so we all decided to come with him. <laughs> It was such a, a powerful example of how much that day meant to a survivor of a previous attack. Uh, I gave the speech that day, but at that, during that speech, uh, my closing thought with all of these uh, Pearl Harbor survivors was this, that I know every generation wonders if the next generation has what it takes to defend America, right? Uh, as we get older, we wonder if the next generation has it. One of the greatest thrills of my whole time as the Chief of Naval Operations was that I got to tell this story to them about the incredible greatness of the young men and women of the United States Navy who wore and did wear the cloth of the nation, re that whole uniform, the cloth of the nation, representing their sense of commitment to and service and sacrifice to the, to the United States of America to make a difference. But that day I got to tell them, 60 years ago, it was your turn. This generation of America knows that it's our turn now and we will fulfill the calling and purpose of the United States Navy taking the sovereignty of the United States of America to the far corners of the earth to defend the principles of freedom and liberty. It's our turn now. And again, for four more years after that, I got to go around the world talking to sailors and saying, it was their turn then, it's our turn now, and it's yours, and it's yours, and it's yours. It's our turn now. I think that uh, the, the very first operations really set the tone for the way this campaign against ter global terrorism was going to be performed. And I do believe also that there were an awful lot of people that used the uh, role of the United States Navy as an example of how it was going to have to unfold. So how did it unfold? Well, it was going to be a, a lot of special force kind of activity uh, working in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan was an incredibly long ways away from the edge of the ocean. Never in history had we conducted uh, uh, flight operations and strike operations at a distance that was that far away. Oh, you'd make one sortie and then a longer distance than that. But I'm talking about uh, the tasking we got from the president. This was a challenge to respond to the direct orders of the president who made the decision to send small special force units into Afghanistan and use our stealth advantage that we have with that kind of a kind of force. But the president said they will never be in there without having a United States of America combat airplane on top of them. That was the tasking. There will always be somebody there. Plus, in order for them to execute their mission, they're going to have to have uh, uh, air vehicles themselves that they can use. And so the mission came for us to provide an aircraft carrier that would have the special forces helicopter uh, helicopters that could go execute a task at a great extended range. And the call was to have combat power overhead all the time. And so we took the USS Kitty Hawk from home base, home based in Yokosuka, Japan. We cleared the decks except for uh, the F-18s that were going to be part of the challenge. We got our fueling from the United States Air Force from ex incredibly extended ranges. And I won't talk about uh, sites and facilities, that doesn't matter. Uh, and for the next number of months, uh, we conducted these operations at ranges that we had never in our history 
uh, executed. And I'll still remember some of the stories. And I would get reports back from our fighter pilots that were, yeah, you know, on top of these special forces doing these incredible covert missions you know, all over Afghanistan. That set the tone for how it was going to be done. And I think what it meant to all of us in the Navy was this. This is a different kind of a war. Uh, don't think conventional wisdom. Uh, think outside the box when we have to think outside the box. But what is our call? The commander in chief gave us this, this uh, call. Be ready. That was our call. And we had great examples from the very beginning about how to answer that call. And I believe it was a real inspiration to the whole Navy. Well, my very first thought when, when I got the report that the first airplane went into the towers, I think uh, I have heard other people say that they had a thought similar to mine. I really thought some poor soul was in a small airplane and had some sort of a medical emergency and you know what happened. And I usually had my uh, uh, television on in my office I never had the sound on unless there was something going on and we turned the sound on. But there was a, a plat in the, cam in the camera, you've seen them where there are four squares, there's four different things popping up. And I could look at that, you know, uh, just in passing and see kind of what was going on in the world. And I didn't spend much time, but it was always on, uh, turned on. That morning the sound was off because I was having a meeting. and. And so I didn't, and also I had moved away from my desk and I was at the table. I didn't see any of this stuff happening uh, when it went down. But the first plane went in and my executive assistant came in and told me, and I thought it was uh, some tragedy, uh, some event where somebody had a problem, small plane. I didn't think anything about what it really was. When the second one went in, I knew instantaneously that this was different. And I walked over to that big bank of phones I was telling you about and I hit the command center. I hit the chairman's office, I said, and the EA answered the phone. I said, where's the chairman? He said, he's out of town. I didn't even say anything. I just hit the next button, the vice chairman, and he was not there. And, and the EA answered the phone, and I said, where is he? He said, he's on Capitol Hill making calls. And I said, so here's the question. Have you guys changed DEF CON yet? I had been the director for operations. I knew all of the various things that were supposed to start happening now. Uh, at that point in time, I picked up the phone. I called Bob Natter, Admiral Robert Natter, <laughs> the commander in, in chief of the United States Atlantic Fleet. I said, Bob, what do you got out there? He said, I've got a carrier doing carrier calls. And I said, do you have any uh, air defense missile shooters? He said, I know I've got two of them that are supposed to be underway. I don't know if they are yet. I said, get them up off New York. Don't wait for direction. Go get some uh, ordnance on that carrier, get some qualified fighter pilots on that carrier and get that baby moving north. And you know what to do next. <laughs> I mean, it was the time to move out. It wasn't the time to cogitate about, you know, how the world was going to unfold. It was time to take action. And I want to tell you, our people were so fabulous in this moment. So my feeling entirely was, uh, and I'm a person of faith, and my prayer was, uh, Lord, give me wisdom in this moment. Haven't ever experienced anything exactly like this, uh, but quicken our minds, all, all of us. And, you know, and so this sense of uh, a united pursuit of the challenge that we're going to face. And then, of course, you know, it was just a few more minutes when we got here. And uh, I'll never forget it as long as I live. The feeling of that percussion, I mean, um, it, it was an amazing moment. So it was a thrill of a lifetime uh, because for, for one thing, it was a time of such consequence. I mean, every day really mattered. Every kind of capability that we could advance and pursue and then have in on the uh, grips of our hands to go apply for the nation, that was the call. And there was, this was not about uh, meeting some task in the past, all of this was staged to a future where we were going to be around the world, around the clock, ready to go. Remember my, the way I said this, 
We've got to give the President of the United States options. And our option in the United States Navy is we don't have to go get permission from another country to go bring our stuff to their country to operate. We have this thing called the freedom of the seas. And we take our sovereignty with us. And we must figure out how to maximize the effective combat power that is possible to uh, withdraw from a force like the United States Navy and apply it at the point of attack. And that was the, it was so exciting to see that. And I want to tell you, uh, I would get reports from uh, uh, what the fleet was doing. On day one, on day one, the Enterprise is on its way home. I'll never forget, I'll never forget the message, the flash message comes in and says, from the Enterprise Group, we are reversing course and heading back to the Middle East. Nobody uh, told them to do it. <laughs> it was just what we were talking about. This is our calling. This is our moment. We have prepared for this all of our lives. Now let's make the nation proud. And it was just a wonderful feeling to be leading a group of men and women who were committed to that destiny. Well, I think that the most important thing I can say to a sailor serving today is this, your service matters. And the word service became one of my favorite words. And I will tell you, I believe when the consequences were the highest, it be that word became even more important. Every day it became more important because none of the things that the Navy can do or it, that it's possible for the Navy to do is, is possible at all without people who will make it come to life and make it work. So I want every person serving today, and remember, I'm one of those uh, uh, generations past, and so, but I have, was gifted with the opportunity to watch our young people respond when the chips were down and when the need was the greatest. I got to see that firsthand. And I want a sailor serving today to know that their service matters more than anything. And I want to thank them for being willing to wear the uniform, the cloth of the nation, and to represent our nation where duty calls. And I want to thank them for being the next generation that takes on the uh, challenges of defending uh, democracy and committing for the United States of America to be the lighthouse of hope and the beacon of liberty around the world. Well, I think the most important thing for sailors to understand is that there's no way for anybody to predict what tomorrow brings. And so that means that we must be prepared for tomorrow. And that means that we must pay the price in these moments of peace before the crisis hits, before the attack occurs. We have to pay the price to make sure that we're ready to answer the call. And that then requires an incredible amount of determination and commitment. Um, I think that our the value code that we talk about in the United States Navy is a good one. Courage, honor, and commitment. Examine those words. The moral courage to step forward. Uh, the commitment to honor and doing things right. But the word commitment all by itself says so much to us. And we can't know what tomorrow is like. And every dawning of a new day when the sun rises, Every dawning of a new day gives us another opportunity to be ready for the unexpected and to ensure that we have paid the price so that we will, in fact, be ready when the time calls. And I want to encourage every person serving to remember that every day. What does tomorrow bring? Am I ready? Are we ready? Is our team ready? Is our squadron ready? Is our total force ready? We're committed to making it so. And thank you for what you do. The young men and women who are wearing the cloth of the nation, representing the United States Navy in the far corners of the earth. Thank you very much.